Our next speaker is Bridget Perrier, who is a First Nation Canadian, and we know that Indigenous women have experienced particularly shocking rates of exploitation in the sex trade. We know that Canada has been going through a very strong political battle over prostitution and decriminalisation. Thank you for coming, and please tell us about what's been happening in Canada. Ani, uh, bonjour. Uh, my name is Bridget, but my real name is Waseakwe, meaning woman of light. I represent, I represent uh, Space International and the many First Nations and Indigenous women and girls around the world who are enslaved in prostitution and are trafficked. I also need to clarify something. It's not the laws that kill our women. It's not the streets that kill our women. It's the men who are killing our women. And I'm going to be very particular because I have been a part of the Picton trial, being that I've raised two daughters who lost their mother, their birth mother, to Robert Picton, a man who murdered prostituted women, vulnerable women, primarily Indigenous women and addicted women. If, when I hear about this whole term safety, please tell us what you're using to screen your calls because there's nothing in safety or screening that can screen a serial killer. Mm -hmm. They're out there preying on the most vulnerable and that's, you know, you naked if you're in the sex trade. So I was lured and debased into prostitution when I was 12 years of age. I grew up on the streets. I was born in Thunder Bay, Ontario, placed up for adoption. I was adopted into a great family who tried to raise me the best way possible. But as I grew older, the effects of colonialism, intergenerational trauma, and child sexual abuse made me a perfect candidate for prostitution. I was lured and debased into prostitution at the age of 12 from a child welfare run group home. I remained enslaved for 10 years in prostitution. I was sold to men who felt privileged to steal my innocent and invade my body. I was paraded like cattle in front of men who were able to purchase me and the acts that I did were something no little girl should ever have to endure in Canada the land of the free. Because of the men, I cannot have a child normally because of the trauma to, done towards my cervix. Also, still to this day, I have nightmares and sometimes I sleep with the lights on. My trauma is deep and sometimes I feel as though I'm frozen or even worse. I'm damaged and not worthy. I was traded in legal establishments, street corners, and strip clubs. I even had a few trips across the Great Lakes servicing shipmen at the age of 13. The scariest thing that ever happened to me was being held captive for a period of 43 hours and raped and tortured repeatedly at the age of 14 years old by a sexual predator who preyed on exploited girls. My exploiters made a lot of money off of me and tried to break me, but I fought for my life. My first pimp was a woman who owned a legal brothel where I was groomed to say that if, if the police came in that I was her niece or, or her daughter's friend. My second pimp was, introdu <clears throat> was introduced to me uh, in Toronto uh, when, because I had to go to the high track to work. Um, I had to prostitute for money. He was supposed to be a bodyguard, but that turned out to be a big lie. Both still are out there doing the same thing to more little girls somewhere in Canada. I was able to exit prostitution and rebuild my life. And with that, my education became a tool. I was recognized for my tenacity and my strength and be and have been able now to be an asset to my community and to my people. I am a mother, activist, and warrior woman, and now my experience may be sacrificial at times. I am doing this for the 
Canada's First Nations women and girls who are being bought and sold and are disappearing and are murdered. We must look at who's doing this. It's the men. I believe that prostitution is not a choice, but it's lack of choice that keep women and girls enslaved. I believe everyone should be shown a viable way out of the sex trade and not be encouraged to stay in it. I believe in helping people understand the full price of life in prostitution before they become involved and in helping women get out alive with their minds, bodies, and spirits intact. Um, to this day, you know, certain smells trigger me. Uh, I cannot be in a room or in an elevator alone with a Caucasian man without feeling scared because my abusers were all white privileged males. Um, we fought really hard for Bill C-36 and with that, you know, I never thought I'd be a lobbyist. I primarily just wanted to be a mom. Um, but I had to do something, because for, for me, I come from intergenerational prostitution. I, I have siblings in prostitution, I had a grandmother in prostitution, and one of my children is involved in prostitution. So I needed to be that person to stop it. And I needed to be that person that my community could look up and say she's an Dichitkogwe warrior woman, which is, you know, what we call women that speak up for us. I also have had um, the privilege of fighting with the pro lobby in Canada. And I understand, you know, when people are in a place of hurt. Because if you would have asked me when I was currently involved in prostitution what I felt, I would have said I'm Queen Supreme Ho because at that time my pain and my trauma was in, in what I would call the game. And for me to sit here and not say I wasn't a part of recruitment of, of other girls, I was. You know, it's a great thing that I, I became an abolitionist because hence if the pro lobby would have got me, I would have been damaging to women. I, um, I am honored that my, you know, I'm here because in my community, women don't get out unless incarceration, uh, mental institution, and death. Uh, and that's what we see. When I tell people in Canada, you don't want me coming to your door because what will hap what's happening is either your daughter's dead and I have to figure out how to branch the family with law enforcement and, and to be that person. They refuse to take, when, when we lose an indigenous woman in prostitution, we can't call funeral homes. They don't wanna to touch our girls. I sat last year with a man after his daughter was thrown from the 22nd floor she had called the police four times. The man who threw her off was a sex buyer. He was never charged. They said the drunk Indian jumped to her death. No funeral home would take her body, and I had to explain to the dad that even though it was illegal, that we had to transfer her body back to her community. We drove with Cheyenne Fox, a mother of a beautiful little boy, Xander Fox, sister of a, you know, Jonathan Fox and Tristan Fox, you know, to sit there and have to drive with someone's body in the back of a pickup truck. You want to talk about indignity? As a mother of two girls who lost their, fa uh, their mother, their birth mother to Robert Picton, you know, my, it was very hard and to see that we had people saying, well, legalization will help women. Our women, you know, in our culture, there's no word for selling sex. Sex is what you, you do to procreate, you do to honor your partner. We don't believe that any, for any indigenous community that prostitution it is something that's beneficial. 
I have to fight with the mining industry because now they have rape camps for our girls because reservations have signed on to huge gold mines. We have to fight the pipeline because the men who are there working the pipeline are abusing our women and girls. In my community, intergenerational prostitution is rampant. And you know, it's not uncommon to see a seven-year-old or a nine-year-old. You know, and how, what do you tell them? That it's okay? That decriminalization will save them? I never met someone who felt, you know, after exiting prostitution felt empowered in it. I know when women say they're, they are empowered to sell their bodies, they have to say that as a coping mechanism. I've worked with over 400 women who have exited and 98% said at one point they wanted out. You know, pretty sad from the 3% that feel that they have the right to speak for us. They don't have that right. I have watched what the game's done to my daughter, my child that was born. I never ever imagined my child would go in prostitution. And I say this as an advocate, you know, and I, you know, we've done everything to rescue, you know, and take her out of it, but we have to kind of let her be at this point <clears throat> and love her. But I know this from talking with her. She can't help doing what she's doing because her addiction is so rampant. If I had the magic wand, I would wave it over her and she'd be better. Just like when she was four years old, I could kiss her knees, make her fever go away. But she told me exactly, mom, this wasn't my calling. You know, this isn't something she inspired to do. And it's, she calls it her handcuffs. It's her handcuffs because she can't do anything. She can't function without having to sell her body. I vow to the day I die that I will be an abolitionist and I will make sure that men are held accountable to the highest for what they've done. I also believe that I do not need to build my daughters. I need to teach my son that he cannot rape. And it starts right there. I also know that my children will be my voice. And when I die, no matter what, they're going to be there talking. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say miigwech and tansy. Thank you.